let's turn together in Jeremiah's prophecy to the 11th chapter. The 11th chapter will be the subject of our, our sermon this evening. Jeremiah 11, beginning in verse 1, where God's word re- reads as follows. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, hear the words of this covenant and speak to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Cursed be the man who does not hear the words of this covenant that I commanded your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Listen to my voice and do all that I command you. So shall you be my people, and I will be your God, that I may confirm the oath that I swore to your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as this day. Then I answered, So be it, Lord. And the Lord said to me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Hear the words of this covenant and do them. For I solemnly warned your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, warning them persistently, even to this day, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but everyone walked in the stubbornness of his his evil heart. Therefore I brought upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did not. Again, the Lord said to me, A conspiracy exists among the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words. They have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant that I made with their fathers. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am bringing disaster upon them that they cannot escape. Though they cry to me, I will not listen to them. Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry to the gods to whom they make offerings, but they cannot save them in the time of their trouble. For your gods have become as many as your cities, O Judah, and as many as the streets of Jerusalem are the altars you have set up to shame altars uh, to shame altars to make offerings to Baal. Therefore, do not pray for this people, or lift up a cry or a prayer on their behalf. For I will not listen when they call to me in the time of their trouble. What right has my beloved in my house when she has done many vile deeds? Can even sacrificial flesh avert your doom? Can you then exult? The Lord once called you a green olive tree, beautiful, with, gr- with good fruit. But with the roar of a great tempest, he will set fire to it, and its branches will be consumed. The Lord of hosts who planted you has decreed disaster against you because of the evil that the house of Israel and the house of Judah have done, provoking me to anger by making offerings to Baal. The Lord made it known to me, and I knew. Then you showed me their deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not know it was against me they devised schemes, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. But, O Lord of hosts, who judges righteously, who tests the hearts, heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the men of Anathoth, who seek your life and say, Do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, or you will die by our hand. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will punish them. The young men shall die by the sword, their sons and their daughters shall die by famine, and none of them shall be left. For I will bring disaster upon the, upon the men of Anathoth, the year of their punishment. So far the reading from God's word this evening. May he add its blessing to our hearts. Whenever you start talking about obedience, it becomes a controversial subject, even within the Christian church. If you emphasize obedience at the expense of grace, of course you become a Pharisee. But if you do not emphasize obedience at all, you end up in exile, like the Israelites are about to to do. And so the important part when it comes to the obedience of God's people is to get the setting right. In what context is it right to talk about the obedience of God's people? And the setting for this Christian obedience is within the confines of the blessing of God's covenant relationship with His people. As Redeemer, Jesus Christ says to His people, I have purchased you, I've saved you, and here, now here, here is the life of free obedience that I give to you. 
But what happens when the church willfully ignores God's covenant words? What if the church willfully ignores walking obediently in light of the covenant promises that God has established for them? And what we see in this chapter this evening is that God judges His people, not because they're ignorant and they've made mistakes, but because of their willful sin, their violation of the words of God's covenant. And so first we want to see tonight the covenant broken, then we want to see the God forsaken, and then we want to see the people ignored as we try to learn this theological truth that God judges His people not because of their ignorance and mistakes, but because of their willful sin, their violation of the words of God's covenant. So again, to learn that lesson, we'll look at the covenant broken, the God forsaken, and the people ignored. We're going to begin by looking at the covenant broken. So far in Jeremiah's prophecy, as we try to summarize and gain some context as to where we are when we come to chapter 11, uh, the prophet has been a mouthpiece for God against the people, always against the church. Uh, God, through Jeremiah, is not speaking to the nations outside of Israel. He's speaking to Israel. And when he's speaking to Israel, he's warning them of this imminent judgment that's coming. And he has confronted them, Jeremiah, as God's mouthpiece. He's confronted them with violations of different commandments that God has set before his people. We've seen him speak to them about the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. The seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. The eighth commandment, you shall not steal. The ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness. And today's chapter is really bringing together the overarching cause as to why Israel would be engaging in violating 6th, 7th, 8th, and the ninth commandments of uh, the, the, the law of God. It's dealing with the overarching cause of these violations. And so, in order to gain the context and the understanding that we need, I want us to consider Deuteronomy 4 and verse 13 first. There we have to understand what Jeremiah is talking about when he re constantly repeats this phrase, the words of this covenant. What are the words of this covenant that Jeremiah is talking about? And in uh, Deuteronomy 4 and verse 13, you see there Moses speaking to the people of Israel as he's uh, commanding them to follow after the Lord. He says, He, God, declared to you His covenant, which He commanded you to perform, that is, the Ten Commandments, and He wrote them on the tablets of stone. Now, if you're reading from an ESV translation of the Bible, you see after the words commandments, a little to, a little footnote, and it says that the Hebrew word literally is words. So that when we talk about the Ten Commandments in English, in the Hebrew, they would really read it as the Ten Words, the Ten Words of the Covenant of God. And so when Jeremiah is declaring to the people of Israel about the words of this covenant, as he does in, in verse 2, in verse 3, in verse 6, and verse 8, what he really is doing is he's reminding Judah of their covenant obligations. God, in entering into covenant with his people, has set before them certain things that they must do. Now, there's no doubt as God's people, we live under the covenant of grace. Ever since the fall, God has promised to His people a gracious interaction with them, fulfilling what we can no longer do. Because of our fall into sin, we cannot live in obedience. All of our, our human nature is corrupted. Our thoughts, our words, our actions, our desires, our motivations, all of them are bent towards sin. And God will fulfill what must be done to grant life to His people. But that doesn't mean there are no obligations for the people of God. There are still obligations for the people of God. The covenant of grace is not a removal of all obligation. The covenant of grace is not saying because Christ is going to pay my debt, therefore I don't have to worry about walking in obedience before the Lord anymore. The people of God, it says in Deuteronomy 4, are to keep the words of this covenant. The problem with Judah, of course, is that they have forgotten the command of God. The people of Judah no longer walk according to the words of the covenant. In Deuteronomy 29 and verse 9, God commands them explicitly that they're to walk in these ways. It says, keep the words of this covenant. Again, that same phrase, the words of this covenant. Keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. God's law is not irrelevant to the people of Judah, even though God, as their gracious covenant, God gives them 
redemption. God's law isn't irrelevant because, uh, because God continues to demand of us obedience. We don't accomplish salvation through this obedience, but God expects of his people that they live obediently in light of the covenant promises. Uh, obedience is the, the thing that the people of God enjoy as a blessing. When God's people walk in obedience to Him, they enjoy the blessings of God. And when they walk in disobedience, it says in Deuteronomy 28 that they will receive curses from God. There will be one or the other. And that's not works righteousness. To say that God blesses His people for obedience is not legalism. It's not works righteousness. It's, it's God's order. It's His sure word to His covenant people. And that's not just for the time when the people were gathered around Mount Sinai. So central are these words of this covenant that the kings of Israel were expected to visibly affirm the words of this covenant when they assumed the throne in the kingdom of Israel. And I want to use one king as an example, King Josiah, in 2 Kings 23. And in 2 Kings 23, of course, Josiah is very young when he becomes king. But when he assumes the throne, it says in the third verse, the king, uh, and the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul and to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And so the king of Judah, Josiah, was expected to live according to the words of this covenant. The same words of this covenant that Jeremiah is now setting before the people of Judah and saying, you have forsaken these words. And so it's a, it's a reaffirmation, or at least as we think about these words of this covenant, it's a reaffirmation of the centrality of the ten words of the covenant that God has given to them. And again, Judah is not living according to to these words. Judah has forsaken these words. The law has been forgotten by the people of Israel. And to realize that, you really have to do nothing else than to think about the context in which Jeremiah prophesied. Jeremiah prophesied during the reign of Josiah, uh, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and Jehoahaz. And uh, so that, that spans really the period from Josiah all the way until the exile of the people of of Judah. And when you think about those kings, Josiah was a godly king. He was used by God to bring about much reform in the land of Judah. And after Josiah died in battle, his son Jehoahaz assumed the throne, and Jehoahaz was an evil king. After Jehoahaz died, he was only on the throne for a short time. Je Josiah's other son, Jehoiakim, he assumed the throne, and he was evil before the Lord. And after he died, Jehoiakim's son Jehoiakim assumed the throne, and, and he was an evil king. Of those four kings, only Josiah was godly. But we have to think more of the context of Josiah's reign, because if you think about Josiah, you look at 2 Kings 22, verse 8 and following. It's during the reign of Josiah, the only godly king among the mix, that the law of God was found. The people of Israel had lost it altogether. And it's found when Josiah is probably in his mid-twenties. The only godly king among them was godly in spite of the faithlessness of the people. They didn't even have the law. It's evident when the people of God discover the law and they read it. They're heartbroken. They tear their garments because they realize their guilt before the God of heaven. They realize they're not living according to the words of this covenant. And so when Josiah finds the law, it's the contents of this law are, are unknown to him. And so the neglect of the people of Judah, even during the reign of the only godly king in that mix of four kings, their neglect is so great that the law has all but been forgotten. Now, I want us to notice that forgetting the law like that by the people of God that's not simply ignorance. That's not just an innocent mistake. When the people of God forsake God's word to such an extent that they don't even know what the commandments say anymore, that's a generational 
closing of the minds through the Father to the children. When a nation or when God's people forget God's word, it's because they willfully turn their back on God. They willfully say, His word is not important to me. And they turn their back on God. And so Jeremiah recognizes that Judah has not obeyed the words of this covenant. And, though, and because they have not, therefore, judgment and covenant curses are coming upon them. And so when you think about what Jeremiah is describing in, in verse 3 through 8 of, of, of our chapter that we've read, you know, this whole idea of the judgment that's, that's coming to them, he's simply reiterating something that he had already set before them. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28 make it very clear that if you don't walk according to my commandments, these curses will come upon you. And the final manifestation of the curse of God is that they will be taken out of the land. They will be uh, ushered into exile. God is reminding Judah of the deliverance that he gave to them from Egypt when he made them his own people. He's reminding them of this covenant that he's made with them, and he's reminding them of the obligations that he set before them. And Judah knew these obligations, but now they have forsaken them. Instead of obeying the Lord, they are walking, it says in verse 8 of our chapter, they're walking in the stubbornness of their evil hearts. And so when Jeremiah is describing the people of Judah, I hope we see the picture that he's painting. He's not painting the picture of people who are, are, are doing a little uh, accident uh, one day, uh, one hour of one day of their lives. He's describing a nation that has willfully, a covenant people that has willfully turned against the God of heaven and earth. He's describing sin with a high hand. It's a people that knew and intentionally turned away from the Lord God. And so when God speaks of his covenant obligations for his people in the covenant of grace, he, he says that you are to do these things because of your deliverance, because your hearts have been circumcised because you have been regenerated the obedience to the law of god is an evidence it's not a cause of entering into god's covenant family it's an evidence of being part of god's covenant family so that's what jeremiah is talking about when he reminds them of these obligations and to talk about obedience in that way is not legalism legalism says i get or i stay in the covenant of grace by my obedience but god is calling judah's attention to their obligations because they are already part of the covenant family of god uh, judah's uh, problem of course in these passages isn't so much uh, that legalistic pursuit of obedience in the hope of merit there's actually an opposite problem going on in their lives that would be more the problem of the pharisees during jesus day but in Jeremiah's day, there's a blatant disregard for the law of God, for the words of this covenant that God has given to the people of Judah. The problem with Judah is not that they're legalistic in their righteousness. The problem with Judah is that they are covenant breakers. Not just the kind of subtle internal sin that sometimes we might struggle with, but they're dealing with kind of the explicit external kind of of sin, this sin, this willful sin, this sin with a high hand. And that's far closer to what the North American church struggles with in our own day. In Josiah's day, the law was lost. I wonder if it's functionally lost in the church today. I wonder how many people if you, who profess Christ, if you pulled them off the street, if they could even find it in their Bible. Where are the two places where the Ten Commandments of God are recorded? The church didn't lose this awareness out of ignorance, of course, but the church lost this awareness out of neglect. When you neglect God's word, then these things come upon us. Despite the grace of Christ and redemption, the contemporary church largely ignores the law. But the law remains, just as it's a covenant obligation for the people of Jeremiah's day, so it's a covenant obligation for us in this day. We can't walk away from the law of God. There may be a change in the economy of God's relationship with His people in the New Testament, but the basic structure remains the same. 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now here are the ten words of this covenant and walk according to them. Well, Jesus in Matthew 5 and verse 17 says that nothing of the law of God will be revoked. Not a jot or a tittle will pass away from the law until all is fulfilled. This is the truth of the New Testament. And people might say, well, yes, but we're under the covenant of grace now. It's a misunderstanding of when the covenant of grace started in the first place. Right? But there is also a, a misunderstanding of what it means to be justified by faith, as if justification by faith voids you of any obligation to obey the law of God. And you see that discussion in Paul's letter to the Romans, where he's, he's talking about man's inability to justify himself in Romans 3. He, do, he paints this picture of mankind as this vile creature. He can do nothing to move towards God, and they don't do anything to move towards God. It talks about how we are justified by faith alone, that that. It's nothing that man can do, but that Christ does work in us to bring us to himself. And then at the end of that church, third chapter, he says, do we then overthrow throw the law by this faith? And the answer comes back, by no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. It's the same structure. It's the same structure in Jeremiah's day as it is in our day. We come into relationship with God by grace through faith. And because he calls us as his own people, he says, Therefore, because I have shed my blood for the guilt of your sins, because I've purchased you for myself, you're no longer your own. You belong to me. And this is how God's covenant people live. We live according to the words of this covenant. And so the warning that applied to the people of Judah... That same warning applies to us. It applies to us today as well. So we see kind of the, the breaking of the covenant of the people of Judah. Now I want us to consider that they have forsaken God in the process. Uh, Judah's covenant breaking is a, a sure sign of forsaking God, of course. In the law you have traditionally described as two tables. You have the first table which has the first four commandments that deal with our relationship with God and in the fifth through the tenth commandment, on the, in the second table of the law, they deal with how we relate to our neighbor. And so far, Jeremiah's confrontation in his prophecy has been over the second table of the law. He's dealt with how disobedience to God is manifest in, in how we treat each other through his description of the violations of the sixth through the ninth commandments. But these sins, these sins against the second table of the law, they're only happening because the first through the fourth commandment have already been left behind. Already the people of Judah has this, have decided, I don't want to serve this God of Scripture. I want to serve Him in my own way. And His name is not holy in my lips. And I will not worship Him as He asks me to worship Him. I will not set aside time to worship Him as He should be worshipped. The worship of God is completely forsaken. And you see that in this this chapter of Jeremiah's prophecy. If you look in, in verse 10, it says, that, uh, it says there that they have gone after other gods. In verse 12, it says that they have made offerings to these other gods. In verse 13, it says that they've multiplied the number of gods that they serve. They've, they've chased after all sorts of gods. And central among those gods has been uh, Baal, this fertility god of the people who lived around them. Uh, years later, after Jeremiah is, uh, is, is dead and gone, most likely. Ezekiel is a prophet. He prophesies when, when Judah is in exile already. And he describes, in hindsight, what the people of Judah have been like in order to uh, be carried off into exile. In the fifth chapter of Ezekiel's prophecy, in the sixth verse, it says of Judah, she has rebelled against my rules by doing wickedness more than the nations and against my statues more than the countries all around her. For they have rejected my rules and have not walked in my statutes. Well, what's the commitment of Judah? They have forsaken the words of this covenant and they have forsaken it with zeal. Judah is not just flirting with the line of sin, are they? I mean, there's the pool of sin, right? Sometimes we do this when we're getting into a pool. We, we put our toes in because we don't want the shock. It never helps, right? But we don't want the shock of jumping into a, a cold pool. Uh, Judah's not playing with the edge of the pool. What Judah has done is they've taken a running, running start from about 10 feet away and they've jumped right into the middle of this pool of sin and they're just, they're just wallowing in this sin. They have forsaken the law of God. They have forsaken the words of this covenant. They have gone 
after other gods. They have worshipped him according, or they have worshipped these gods according to the evil desires of their hearts. And you see, it's in the forsaking of the Lord that the foundation of these other sins is laid. Because they have replaced Yahweh, the God who called them out of Ur of the Chaldeans through their father Abraham. Because they have forsaken him, they have pursued the evil desires of their hearts. And because they pursue the evil desires of their hearts, therefore, now you see the fruit of it. You see the people of Judah murdering their children on, in idol sacrifice. You see the people of Judah committing spiritual and physical adultery. You see them deceiving and defrauding each other. You see them corrupted as a nation with a lying spirit. These are results. These are the results of forsaking the God of the covenant. And these people of Judah are so far in the middle of this pool that they don't even like the lifeguards anymore. The lifeguards are there to save life. Jeremiah is there as a lifeguard in a sense. He's calling out to them. Return to the side. Return to your God. But they hate the messenger as well. When you hate God you will hate his messengers too. And the interesting thing, of course, about this last section in this chapter where it speaks of the men of Anathoth. If you look at Jeremiah 1, verse 1, you see that that was Jeremiah's hometown. That's where Jeremiah was from. The people of Anathoth knew Jeremiah as a brother. That's where this, this group of priests had been, had been placed. And they served the Lord side by side there for a season, but now, now they hate this messenger of truth. They hate the one who calls them to repentance, and they want him silenced. And what does it say in verse 21 that they, will, that they are willing to do in order to get this silence? It says, you will die by our hand if you're not silent. That's what the men of Anathoth say to Jeremiah. Of course, that's a a common reaction among men, of course, when they're confronted with the Word of God. They hate the one who, who brings the message. But that's to their own detriment. The only path to restoration is in the path of repentance. The only path to restoration is the path of confession of sin to God, trusting in Him for salvation. And that way of salvation isn't a mystery. It's contained in the words of this covenant, this word of this covenant that they have neglected. God's Word tells us that through our, our disobedience to the law, we see our need for a Savior. We see our need for Christ. We see that someone else must atone for our sins. Someone else must carry the wrath, must be that propitiatory sacrifice on our behalf. And that person is identified in God's Word as the Lord Jesus Christ, very clearly. But Judah is not interested in that message. They prefer to walk in their own ways. Now, they're covenant breakers. They have forsaken the God of the covenant. And now they become the people ignored. Their choice has placed them firmly in the bog of God's covenant curses. Moses has foretold very clearly what would happen if Israel fa failed to obey God's commandments. Judah has seen this curse carried out already. The northern tribes, the ten northern tribes, carried into exile over a hundred years before this prophecy is, is even spoken. But yet, there's not any repentance from the people of Judah. And so now, the curse of disaster is being unleashed on them because of their idolatry. The people who attack this messenger will be attacked themselves. Their hatred of God will lead to their complete destruction. It says in uh, the book of Ezra, when you have the return of the exiles, it mentions the town of Anathoth and how many people return from the town of Anathoth. Do you know how many people return from exile from the town of Anathoth? 128. 128 men return from the town of Anathoth. The disaster that God has decreed for them will certainly come to pass. The only way to avert this disaster is is faith and repentance, and these are, are gifts from God, but because of the hardness of their heart against God, He is hardened against them. He says to Jeremiah, don't even pray for them. I won't hear them if they pray to me. So hard has their heart been against the God of heaven. 
He will remove his nourishing favor over his people. It's re represented in, our, in this prophecy in verse 16 as a, a green olive tree. And instead, he's going to visit fire on his people. He's going to burn up the branches of this previously green olive tree. It's a terrible thought, isn't it? A terrible thought that God would ignore his people when they cry out to him. That God would ignore those who are in covenant with him because of their willful defiance. But what we see here in Jeremiah's prophecy is really only a foretaste. It's really only a foretaste of what will be. Obedience to uh, the words of the covenant of grace are, are essential to salvation. That's right, I said it. Obedience to the words of this covenant are essential to salvation. It's not the cause of salvation. It's not the cause of salvation. But when you are saved, these words will bear fruit in your life. You will see obedience in your life. You will see this fruit. And we see that in, in, in Jesus' own teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. In chapter 7, verse 21, talking about laying up uh, treasure uh, in, in, in heaven. And uh, I'm in chapter 6, that's not going to help. So in chapter 21, it says, it's a terrifying passage of Scripture, right? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. God will ignore some people who, at least on the outside, call on him, on him by name. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Who will enter the kingdom of heaven? The one who calls on him and does the words. There's faith and repentance. There is belief and practice. And the practice doesn't lead to belief, but the belief leads to the practice. And so the people of God must walk according to the words of this covenant. Think of Jesus when he begins his ministry. He begins his ministry and he begins crying out to the people of Israel. He comes to seek and to save the lost. And so he calls them. And what does he call them to do? In Mark 1 verse 15, what does he call them to do? Repent and believe. Believe and repent. The latter, this repenting, is an evidence of the former. So Jesus Christ comes to purchase salvation. He purifies his people. And willful sin is not excused among the people who are in covenant with God. When the one who professes faith in Christ continues to walk in disobedience to the words of God's covenant, to the Ten Commandments, what will God say? It's a terrifying part of this, this passage from Matthew 7 that we were reading in verse 23. Jesus continues his teaching. He's just called people to, to believe and to do the will of the Father. And if they don't do it, it says that, they will, that then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's God's response to covenant breakers. That's God's response to those who forsake him. It is a, 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 an ignoring from God's part on the, heart, the hardened in heart. They will be ignored. Their cries will be too late. And, and Jesus Christ, as judge of all, will cast them into a place where there is eternal weeping, where there is eternal gnashing of teeth. And that's what's happening to Judah in our chapter here. That's what's happening to Judah. But what's happening to Judah is only a foretaste. Because what will happen to the one who hardens his heart against Christ uh, and, and when Christ returns to judge them, their agony will be eternal. There will be no hope of return. There will be no hope of restoration. The exile away from the presence of God will be permanent and it will be forever. Hell is filled with covenant breakers. It's filled with those who are condemned, who are judged under the covenant of works where perfection is required to to gain life or to be granted life. Only in the covenant of grace is there hope where God purchases his people with the blood of Christ, where, where God gives faith and repentance to his people. So when we think of the people of Judah in this 11th chapter of Jeremiah's prophecy, it teaches us that we should never, as God's people, forsake the Lord 
our God. I find it in my own spiritual arrogance as well. I see it in the rest of the church as I look around. I see that I'm quick to notice when my fellow man is living in idolatry, as far as I can tell. But I'm slow to examine my own heart as to the idolatries of my own heart. But the Bible's call to God's people is constant. Return from your idolatry. Do not forsake the Lord. People of God, we need to get the first commandment right. Because if we don't get the first commandment right, we're not going to get any of the other ones right either. So we have to examine the idolatries of our heart. Not our neighbor's heart. The idolatries of our heart. The church is constantly being called to wake up to return from worldliness, to set their eyes on the things above, not on earthly, earthly things, to, forsake, uh, to not to forsake their first love, to repent for allowing immorality in the church. And these are questions we should be asking ourselves. Are these things that we are welcoming? Are these things that we have become lazy about? Are these things that we have become neglectful about? A failure to examine ourselves carefully could lead to the back of God being turned on us because we have turned our backs on God. So in this chapter, we see a clear exposition of the core problem of Judah and by extension, the core problem of the church. It all begins with the first commandment. It all begins with the first table of the law. Failure to worship God, replacing Him with idols, that's never an accident. That's never an accident, especially in the life of the covenant people of God. It's a decision of the will. It's, a, it's an act of rebellion. It's a turning of our backs on God. And it says in our passage that if we turn our backs on God and if we refuse to hear His call for repentance, He will turn His back on us. So, people of God, we're called to repent. We're called to turn for the forgiveness of sin. We're called to flee to Him that we might never hear God casting us out and declaring us workers of iniquity whom He never knew. Let's pray together.